Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels, and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 8. An Entrance by Favor Although he did not suspect the fact... The mayor of M. Sir M. enjoyed a sort of celebrity. For the space of seven years, his reputation for virtue had filled the whole of Bas Boulonnais. It had eventually passed the confines of a small district, and had been spread abroad through two or three neighboring departments. Besides the service which he had rendered to the chief town by resuscitating the black jet industry, there was not one out of the hundred and forty communes of the arrondissement of M. Sir M. which was not indebted to him for some benefit. He had, even at need, contrived to aid and multiply the industries of other arrondissements. It was thus that he had, when occasion offered, supported with his credit and his funds the linen factory at Boulogne, the flax spinning industry at Frevent, and the hydraulic manufacture of cloth at Bubis sur Canchi. Everywhere the name of Monsieur Madeleine was pronounced with veneration. Eris and Douai envied the happy little town of Emserim its mayor. The councillor of the royal court of Douai, who was presiding over this session of the Assizes of Eris, was acquainted, in common with the rest of the world, with his name which was so profoundly and universally honored. When the usher, discreetly opening the door which connected the council chamber with the courtroom, bent over the back of the president's armchair and handed him the paper on which was inscribed the line which we have just perused, adding, "'The gentleman desires to be present at the trial.' The president, with a quick and deferential movement, seized a pen and wrote a few words at the bottom of the paper and returned it to the usher, saying, Admit him. The unhappy man, whose history we are relating, had remained near the door of the hall, in the same place and the same attitude in which the usher had left him. In the midst of his reverie, he heard someone saying to him, Will Monsieur do me the honor to follow me? It was the same usher who had turned his back upon him, but a moment previously who was now bowing to the earth before him. At the same time, the usher handed him the paper. He unfolded it, and as he chanced to be near the light, he could read it. The president of the court of assizes presents his respects to Monsieur Madeleine. He crushed the paper in his hand as though those words contained for him a strange and bitter aftertaste. He followed the usher. A few minutes later, he found himself alone in a sort of wainscoted cabinet of severe aspect, lighted by two wax candles, placed upon a table with a green cloth. The last words of the usher who had just quitted him still rang in his ears. Monsieur, you are now in the council chamber. You have only to turn the copper handle of yonder door, and you will find yourself in the courtroom behind the president's chair. These words were mingled in his thoughts with a vague memory of narrow corridors and dark staircases which he had recently traversed. The usher had left him alone. The supreme moment had arrived. He sought to collect his faculties, but could not. It is chiefly at the moment when there is the greatest need for attaching them to the painful realities of life that the threads of thought snap within the brain. He was in the very place where the judges deliberated and condemned. With stupid tranquility, he surveyed this peaceful and terrible apartment, where so many lives had been broken, which was soon to ring with his name, 
and which his fate was at that moment traversing. He stared at the wall. Then he looked at himself, wondering that it should be that chamber and that it should be he. He had eaten nothing for four and twenty hours. He was worn out by the jolts of the cart, but he was not conscious of it. It seemed to him that he felt nothing. He approached a black frame which was suspended on the wall, and which contained, under glass, an ancient autograph letter of Jean-Nicolas Pache, mayor of Paris and minister, and dated, through an error no doubt, the 9th of June of the year two, and in which Pache forwarded to the commune the list of ministers and deputies held in arrest by them. Any spectator who had chanced to see him at that moment, and who had watched him, would have imagined, doubtless, that this letter struck him as very curious, for he did not take his eyes from it and he read it two or three times. He read it without paying any attention to it, and unconsciously. He was thinking of Fantine and Cosette. As he dreamed, he turned round, and his eyes fell upon the brass knob of the door which separated him from the court of assizes. He had almost forgotten that door. His glance, calm at first, paused there, remained fixed on that brass handle, then it grew terrified and little by little became impregnated with fear. Beads of perspiration burst forth among his hair and trickled down upon his temples. At a certain moment, he made that indescribable gesture of a sort of authority mingled with rebellion, which is intended to convey and which does so well convey. Parju, who compels me to this? Then he wheeled briskly round, caught sight of the door through which he had entered in front of him, went to it, opened it and passed out. He was no longer in that chamber. He was outside in a corridor. A long, narrow corridor broken by steps and gratings, making all sorts of angles, lighted here and there by lanterns similar to the night taper of invalids, the corridor through which he had approached. He breathed. He listened. Not a sound in front. Not a sound behind him and he fled as though pursued. When he had turned many angles in this corridor, he still listened. The same silence reigned, and there was the same darkness around him. He was out of breath. He staggered, he leaned against the wall. The stone was cold, the perspiration lay ice cold on his brow. He straightened himself up with a shiver. Then, there alone in the darkness, Trembling with cold and with something else too, perchance, he meditated. He had meditated all night long. He had meditated all the day. He heard within him but one voice which said, alas. A quarter of an hour passed thus. At length, he bowed his head, sighed with agony, dropped his arms and retraced his steps. He walked slowly and as though crushed. It seemed as though someone had overtaken him in his flight and was leading him back. He re-entered the council chamber. The first thing he caught sight of was the knob of the door. This knob, which was round and of polished brass, shone like a terrible star for him. He gazed at it as a lamb might gaze into the eyes of a tiger. He could not take his eyes from it. From time to time he advanced a step and approached the door. Had he listened, he would have heard the sound of the adjoining hall like a sort of confused murmur. But he did not listen. And he did not hear. Suddenly, without himself knowing how it happened, he found himself near the door. He grasped the knob convulsively. The door opened. He was in the courtroom. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today. While well, we read a bite of one of your favorite classics... Again, my name is Brie Carlyle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.